Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Carol Gold, who is Professor of Philosophy at Florida Atlantic University, where she teaches primarily aesthetics, philosophy of psychiatry, and ancient Greek philosophy, areas in which she publishes widely. Many of her recent publications concern the relation between aesthetics, ethics, and personhood. She's currently completing a book on true glamour, an unexplored topic in philosophy that stands at the intersection of aesthetics, ethics, and philosophy of psychiatry. Welcome, Carol. Hi, Gil. Um, you, you were working on a book um, when, when we were talking about this a few months ago. Uh, I think you're still working on the title as well. It was a book on glamour. Maybe it is something like glamour, authenticity, deteriority, and personhood or something along those lines. Uh, but you mentioned in your note, uh, in your email, that you have been refining and perhaps changing some of your thoughts. Um, and so, so I want to pick up on that. Uh, we talked a bit about glamour. We, <laughs> we had a bit of a debate around uh, can we even get a computer to, to identify glamour in a human being? Uh, that is still up for debate. Um, but uh, so, so how, how are your uh, thoughts perhaps uh, changed a bit in the book? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because your question actually prompted me to <laughs> develop in certain ways because I was thinking about uh, how much I, AI can do now, we see. And uh, I was at a talk uh, a couple of months ago I mean, on Zoom, <laughs> of course. And the speaker was showing uh, artworks and they were, they were really quite impressive. And they turned out that they had been created by machines. And right. I thought, hmm, okay, so the idea here was that the machine could recognize standards of beauty and or artistic conventions, because in some cases, I wouldn't call them beautiful, but they were interesting and artistic. Um, I mean, not groundbreaking artistic, <laughs> but you know, uh, they they were quite quite artful, let me say. And then uh, I thought about all these things that machines are being able to do. And I have a friend here who uh, who works in AI, and uh, it, it's just extraordinary what I'm what I've been learning, but. You asked me, can a machine recognize glamour? And I must say, I was baffled by that. And at first, I thought, hmm. My inclination now is to say no, and I'll explain why. Yeah. Um, and I had, and that led me to ask another question. Can a machine, can something artificially intelligent be glamorous? <laughs> right. I mean, because they're talking about machines being able to make 
ethical uh, judgments. I, I take it fairly simple ones. Um, but, you know, machine can can certainly be programmed to understand understand whatever they do. Um, yeah. Rules, you know, which ethical rules or laws, etc. But um, then we get to the aesthetic, and you and I had talked about that briefly um, in our email. And I thought to myself, well, can can a machine be glamorous? And there was a film in 2013. Hmm. It was called Her. I don't know if you saw it. Oh, yeah. I, I, ca I haven't seen it. I have heard about it, yeah. Okay, it was this Joaquin Phoenix, um, yeah. who's always a very convincing actor. <laughs> and um, he falls in love with an AI assistant, you know, yeah. of some kind. And that made me wonder, well, can that AI-generated entity be, be glamorous? Right. And I have determined, at least I think I've concluded, not. <laughs> and yeah. uh, uh... I know to both questions, can a machine recognize glamour and can a machine be glamorous? And yeah. I'm inclined to say no in both cases. <laughs> yeah, so, so here is going to be the deficiency of machines. So going back to your, uh, your uh, art-creating machine, I think what the machine will do is to create art that the average population would find interesting or attractive. Attractive, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Right, because it, it's sort of uh, given, given, an, given a task, it will sort of optimize, um, optimize the output, right? So mm -hmm. it has to design to the average person, uh, given the heuristics it has, now, what it will miss in that process is, as you say, yeah, it's interesting art, but not great art, right? So, yeah. so one could argue, yeah, machine could make interesting art, but it won't be able to push it to, um, to the tails of the distribution, right? Because yeah. it, it, will, it will feel meaningless <laughs> to the machine to do that. Yes, well, it will feel meaningless, and you wouldn't express it to be. You wouldn't expect it to be terribly expressive. <laughs> um, but also, one of the things that makes art, I think, excellent, and what certainly makes it great, is that it kind of pushes the rules. It it pushes the limits. It it violates rules, and that's really what uh, what propels changes in in yeah. art. I think in, in all of the arts, you know, it's like with Debussy, you know, uh, his experimentation with, uh, with harmony um, and say the, some of the abstract, uh, early 20th century abstract painters who started, you know, who started experimenting with abstraction and, you know, despite the fact that they were violating so many rules like about picture space and uh, color theory and so forth and perspective, um, you know, the yeah. piece was called a fauvist because his way of painting was considered so wild, his use of color and all, so forth. But, and now, of course, it, it doesn't look at all extraordinary or revolutionary. Uh, so, and Picasso, too, I mean, they're really, what they're doing is pushing the boundaries. What makes them extraordinary is that they're challenging them. That's part of the creativity. That's part of their mm. imaginative process. So, yeah, so that's what I think in a machine or can't do. But, of course, you know much more about that. And I take it that one of the things that machines do, uh, that allows machines to do things that are sometimes referred to or described as better than humans, um, yeah. is the, the speed at which they do it. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Uh -huh. So... You know, humans are terrible in in repeating tasks, in boring <laughs> boring things. Uh, but I want to I want to go to your 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 question about glamour is is really a much more complex question. So there, there, there are two questions you asked, right? One is, uh, can machine recognize glamour, and the other is, can machine be glamorous? 
Yeah, and, and that, those questions are really abstract, complex questions. So, so I want to <laughs> I want to pursue that with you. Okay. And so, so can we go back and and uh, sort of have a you know it's very difficult to define, but do you have a sort of a short description of what you mean by glamour? Well, yes, <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, I'm how precise you you'll find it. I I don't know. Um, but first of all, I make a distinction between true and false glamour. And yeah. I say that true glamour is, and I define it in more detail. I'll define it for you in more detail a little later if, if we have time. Yeah. Um, but true glamour is an unconscious or unintentional okay, mystery. And I think mainly it's a kind of power of coercion. It's an aura. You know, uh, and it's subtle, it's opaque, and importantly, it can't be reproduced It's a, yeah. because it emanates from the interior and one's subjectivity. And that's unique to an individual. I mean, each of us is different subjectively yeah. and for, in a variety of ways. Now, uh, and, and in fact, I compare true glamour to what Walter Benjamin, um, who was a mid 20th century, early 20th century um, writer, uh, called the aura of a work of art. He talks about the work of art in the age of mechanical re re reproduction. And yeah. that is, uh, he says that the aesthetic experience can never be the same because you lose the aura of the work itself when you're looking at a print or something like that. So, um, so if you consider that, I mean, to me, glamour is like the aura of the artwork, <laughs> the original yeah. artwork. And false glamour, I would say, is the use of material culture to suggest that one has a certain status, lifestyle, or position within the elite. I'd say that it's um, common, uh, more common, especially today with social media. It's yeah, yeah. Um, obvious, it's transparent, and also it requires effort. Okay, you have to keep up with the latest whatever um, <laughs> shoes or styles, in, uh, be it in interiors or, or attire or makeup. Uh, and now with our masks, we have to worry, <laughs> you know, I, I guess that the trend is going towards eye makeup. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Uh, that's, um, so false glamour is, you know, what we think of as Hollywood glamour, let's say. Okay. Hmm. So that is, of course, reproducible. Now, I think that false glamour uh, has stirred up a lot of mischief because of the ubiquity of images on social media and the rapid fire pace at which they are produced and can be, uh, can be communicated. So I would say that true glamour can enrich human experience and false glamour, first of all, it can breed exhibitionism, especially today with you know, TikTok and, um, you know, Instagram and <laughs> so forth, and so, and it breeds exhibitionism. I think it breeds false expectations that are usually disappointed by people, and for people, and also conspicuous consumption. You know, it's it's uh, as if it there wasn't enough of it. Um, now, I want to though distinguish, make an important distinction here. Um, I distinguish between character and personality. And I would say that true glamour is not an ethical quality. It's an aesthetic one. Because, you know, we make value judgments of two sorts, um, ethical and aesthetic. And we make value judgments of those sorts about people. Yeah. And so it can, it's very easily confused. Um, so I would attach gl glamour to the personality 
and character and, and one's ethical nature to character. Mm -hmm. um, although in philosophy, I should say both these concepts, character and personality are debated and how they should be analyzed and whether they're just myths and so forth, but uh, philosophical myths that is. Um, so I would say that um, that's something we have to keep in mind. So it, it has to do with personality. And, yeah. you know, there are various dimensions of human experience here. And I think one of them has to do with the role of imagination in everyday life. And I think that once we see that true glamour has to do with, um, with subjectivity, with indiv and thus with individuality, um, uniqueness, and also with personality. I think it's very hard for <laughs> to see how a computer could could recognize that. But you know, you know much more about AI than I do. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so, was, so what I will say, Carol, is I have a sort of a halfway answer to it, and that is, um, so so you differentiate between true glamour and false grammar. Sorry, <laughs> glamour. Um, it appears to me that it is easier to recognize false glamour because it is driven by more stable heuristics. Um, so, so if a human finds easier to identify false glamour, then we would be able to teach a machine to do that. Now, we won't be able to agree with you. We won't be able to teach a machine to... Uh, to identify glamour. So if humans fit into three buckets, glamorous, true, true glamorous, uh, sort of, you know, uh, not glamorous, and then false glamorous, that the third bucket is identifiable, um, very likely by a machine, but it won't be able to give you a positive answer, like you say, uh, the personality is truly glamorous. Yes, and I think that, um, well, you asked how I would define it, okay, and I'll, I'll, I would say, and, and I might I'll probably change my mind about this, or at least <laughs> modify this to some extent, um, the glamour is the expression of an imaginative intensity, and yeah. I describe it as supervening on a projection of a range of imagined identities and possible experiences. And I think that people who, you see, I think it's a rare quality, and I think that we experience it or we recognize it less frequently um, than we perhaps once did because of we're so overwhelmed with the images of false glamour. But um, I think that when it does catch someone's attention, uh, it's a coercion. They're coerced. And that's how I see glamour. I mean, its effect on the observer or the third person effect would be one of coercion. And yeah. uh, because there's an originality and, in, and an intensity or an intensity, let's say, that, um, that somehow emanates, that one emits. And, right. and I think that it, it emphasizes the human, the, the idea of individual and any human individual's uniqueness. Right. It is, uh, it is sort of a two-way street, isn't it? Um, a, a, a glamorous person won't be able to project himself or herself on the audience. Um, let me make a statement. You can correct me, <laughs> correct me, Carol. Uh, glamour emanates from sort of an interaction between the, between the glamorous individual and the audience. If the audience is passive, then I would argue there may not be any glamour. It is, do you see it that way? Well, actually, um, no. <laughs> I think that it's true with false glamour. Um, yeah. But with regard to true glamour, I mean, it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm st I still puzzle over this, but um, in this article I did many, you know, num many years ago, <laughs> number of years yeah. ago, let's say, um, 
you know, I drew on a distinction that I still love, and it's not mine, it's, it's from the philosopher uh, Arthur Danto, who's, who's a major philosopher of our time, who died just recently. And he talks about, he makes a distinction between manifesting itself, which he says is to live in the world as one finds it. It's a way of acting that implies he says no responsibility for creating the world. And then he talks about to express itself in contrast, which is to live in the world as it is, but as he says, containing a fragment of reality from another world. So it has to yeah. do with I mean, a person who's a hermit. I mean, I can't, doesn't really experience much, but it has to do with one's interior imagination and how they, and, and how that affects their being in the world. And I think that others are coerced by it, fascinated by it, and may be inclined to project their, their own fantasies onto that person. But I do think it's, uh, it's quite different. And I think that, so, so glamour would be to express itself rather than manifest itself self rather and I think if that's if that's right if that's right um, yeah then it's not so it it's not so much a relational property I think it's it's something one has um, one has it's um, in in oneself and so but you're right. I mean, there is a sense in which we're inclined to say, hmm, but if nobody sees that, <laughs> if it is, doesn't it have something to do with that? And I would like to just go, if we can go back to, you know, psychoanalysis and hysteria for a moment, which I mentioned yep. when I talked about histrionic personality. Um, if you think about a person who's, I mean, it's not a pleasant thing to think about, but imagine a person who's partially paralyzed, say. Um, and it might be uh, because of a physiological reason. Um, or on the other hand, it could be a hysterical conversion. And mm -hmm. the hysterical conversion, it, it, you know what I mean by that, you know, it, um, uh, uh, some kind of trauma or perceived trauma that a person um, manifests bodily, which was, yeah. it still occurs, although people think it only occurred in the early uh, <laughs> 20th century, late 19th century, but it's, it's always been around, um, hysterical conversion. Um, but you see, the, I would say that the paralysis would be a manifestation or an expression, sorry, an, a manifestation of the self, because that's just the way things are. It's a physiological problem for whatever reason. Or there's a physiological etiology to it. To express the self, the, the hysteric is expressing a self. Yeah. Um, does that clarify it? Yeah, I mean, you know, so if I think about a thought experiment, um, if I put a, a true glamorous person in a world of no other people, would that person be glamorous? Well, you know, I, I was thinking about that because it was such an interesting question. Um, I hadn't thought of it in quite those terms, but um, if the person, I mean, obviously a person, I, I think it's obvious, um, but a person who has had no exposure or interaction with others um, wouldn't yeah. have much of a language or sense of anything. I mean, they wouldn't really be in the world. I mean, I'm not sure people can develop a, a notion, you know, anything like a self in that context. But suppose they had lived in the world, you know, they were, um, yeah. you know, they weren't raised, you know, in, in a forest by animals, but, you know, actually lived in a world um, and then suddenly were, have found themselves isolated for whatever reason. 
Um, I do think that that person could still have a glamour if they have mm -hmm. an active, because we deploy our imaginations in all sorts of ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I think that once that kind of experience, once one has the experience of the world and has lived in a world and developed a personality, um, mm -hmm. then sure, I mean, I shouldn't say sure, but my hunch is to say yes. And with I, I used the word develop a personality. I think that it would be not only strange, but almost abhorrent to call a child glamorous. Um, yeah. Because a child doesn't have a fully formed self. And certainly if they're falsely glamorous, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, so, but I think that's a, that, that's another great question that um, I need to address, you know, to what extent that is it, if it, if it isn't a relational property, to what extent yeah. does it depend upon there being others? Yeah, it's ironically, so uh, if, if it is an inherent property that the person is experiencing, it has no relationship to the environment and the people around that person then I think, Carol, it will be difficult to teach uh, to teach a machine to recognize it. But ironically, I think if that were true, it will be possible to teach a machine to be glamorous. And uh, uh -oh. <laughs> <I'll> give, <laughs> let, let me give you my justification okay. for it. Um, so. So if true glamour is an inherent property, we, we, so that makes the problem simpler in some ways because you don't have to worry about interactions. So I can take that person, put that person in any context, any environment, and I will always, always detect true glamour, right? Because it's inherently experienced by that person regardless of the environment. Um, which makes the problem a lot simpler to model, you know, in, in some ways. And so, so obviously, I, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm just uh, saying things here without knowing a lot about it. Um, but mathematically, it feels like it's a problem that, that could, you could actually teach a machine to be glamorous because it can be reduced to perhaps set of heuristics. Um, whereas recognizing a person to be glamorous is more difficult because the inherent property, uh, at least it sounds to me, is individualistic. In other words, I cannot generalize that property. If, I, if, if Tom is glamorous and Sally is also glamorous, they're glamorous in their own ways. It, it, is, it, is, not, uh, it is not a generalizable property, if I understand mm -hmm. it correctly. Yeah. Do you see it that yes. way? Um, well, what I'm wondering, I mean, is whether a machine, uh, w whether it makes sense to talk about when, and, and again, you're the expert here, right, Gil, on AI, AI not AI. So, um, uh, I mean, could, would it even make sense to talk about a machine having a kind of a personality? Um, yes. What what do you think? I mean, because the machine's history is not dynamic. It's not. It, I mean, I don't know how much it can change. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know, of course, one's personality and one's imagination is going to be uh, partly dependent on their intrinsic traits, but also on the way they've interacted with others in the world and you know the way they develop in, in certain ways and then i think also that <clears throat> since every person i think has a unique take on the world i think that's part of being a person and some are more original yeah. than others but uh 
or more, you know, some people have ironic takes on the world and, you know, so forth and so on. But can we, can a machine be endowed with that kind of subjectivity? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it depends on if you believe this. So personality could be considered um, as an outcome of, as you say, interactions and history, um, environment, uh, and all of that, right? All of that is data, uh, ultimately. And so, suppose we have, this is a thought experiment, really. Suppose we have all the data of, of, uh, of an individual's interactions with, with her environment and, um, and uh, humans that individual react, interacted with, that data can make a machine um, have an equivalent personality of that individual. The premise there obviously is the personality is driven by history and, uh, and interactions. Hmm. So, yeah. And, and I think that's a reasonable assumption, isn't it? When, with regard to persons, you mean, or with, yeah. Yeah, with, with, with the persons. I mean, if, if, when we look at somebody and we see that person's personality, um, that personality was developed by that person over that person's history, right? Yes, uh-huh. And and so, so but glamour to me is a it's more complex construct, right? It, it's not just personality. It is how that person. Um, it's not projection, but how that person experiences the personality in some ways, isn't it? Uh, that's a that's a really good way to put it. Yes. It's how they experience yeah. their personality and how they experience yeah. well, how they experience the world, you know, this which is unique. I mean, for all of us. Um uh, yeah. some some yeah. less um predictable than others, but uh and maybe more interesting. <clears throat> But I do, yeah. I think I think that that's a good point. That it, it's, um, it's not just a personality, but it's also a reflection on the personality. So, and, and what makes it complicated uh, for a machine is that, as you say, it is unique to the individual. So it's not a generalizable um, characteristic. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just really difficult to teach a machine that is not, you know, it's not general, a generalizable, non-generalizable thing, right? If, if so, so we look at Jim and a large proportion of the, the crowd concludes Jim is, uh, Jim has true glamour. And we look at Sally and a large proportion of the crowd believes Sally also has true mm. glamour, but Jim's true glamour is not Sally's true glamour, right. right? Yes. So that's why machines will likely fail. I'm 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 beginning to agree with you now. You're beginning to agree with me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yes, I mean so that's uh so that that would be my answer to your question. <laughs> that would be my my justification yeah. for why I answered your question. No, I mean because I gave it a lot of thought, and it actually led to my um, my refashioning of my argument <laughs> in uh, in one of my in central chapters. So, um, yeah. Yeah. My my uh, no answer, um, uh, Carol, is the, the, the way I'm thinking about it is that because it's unique to the individual, um, the, the, you know, you cannot teach a machine to pick up true glamour from a crowd of thousand people. Let's say there are 10 glamorous people in, in that crowd um, because the that the 10 people have their own unique version of glamour. Yes. 
That's right. That's right. Right. That's right. So, yeah. Um. So, and because it's it's not like say beauty or something like that, and I'm I'm actually not sure that that's so uniform. But you know, I know that some people think that there are that there is uniformity. That there's some standards criteria of beauty that are fixed. But uh, I don't quite agree with that. But still, each person is beautiful differently. Um, but of course, that's not. I don't think that's as, quite as complicated. But if you, you know, if you have ten beautiful people in a crowd, you know, perhaps a machine could pick it up. But with regard to glamour, because it's so elusive, um, and yeah. because it is. It, because it really does emanate from within, from the subject, from one's unique subjectivity and imagination. Uh, right. That's, yeah, so that's, a, but that's a, that, that's, a, it's such an interesting question. I mean, I, and whether a machine could have this property <laughs> is another issue yeah. um, uh, because I mean does a machine um, this is partly rhetorical but also partly a real question does a machine have subjectivity subject yes. subjective experience uh, um, experiences are generally subjective and you know, mo most of, so we are not there, obviously. We, we, we're just talking about how machines could evolve over time. I can see situations where, you know, you, you, would, you would have those types of machines having feelings, machines making decisions under uncertainty. Um, those, things, those things will happen. One way a machine could potentially do an identification of glamour <laughs> Cal, uh, let me know what you think of this. Uh, a machine could devise a set of tests for a human. So a so machine won't be able to just say X is glamorous and Y is not glamorous, but the machine will give set of tests for X and Y. And based on the responses, the machine might be able to assign a higher probability of X being glamorous. I think that might be possible. Hmm. So, what would be the data? Can you can you just re, 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 re articulate <laughs> that because I think I I don't know what the questions would be. I'm I'm assuming here that there's some predictability. Let me know if if this is true. I'm assuming that there is some predictability in the in the output of a glamorous person in a context. So suppose I create a context, put the glamorous person in there, I have some predictability of behavior of that person. Mm, Is there? Well, you see that, I'm inclined right now to disagree with that because yeah. part, of the, part of their glamour is is a mystery i mean it's they are i mean glamour is is something mysterious i mean it evokes mystery i mean it's as i said i mean that's the opacity i was talking about so um and the coercion i think is part of is part of that too the coercive effect it has on the third person um from the third yeah. person point of view is uh, that it, they don't know. They they can't predict as we can with someone who might lack that quality. I mean, anyone can surprise yeah. us at, at any time. But I think that with with a person who's glamorous, there is something uh, unknown by the other, and that's right. partly um, why it's so fascinating. So th so that is why. Um... Uh, you know, when I think about, yeah, I don't understand it, obviously. Um, I think of glamour as a two-way street. It requires 
an originator, it requires somebody to receive it and have some sort of a feedback. Uh, so that's why, uh, but you disagree with that. Um, you know, so, so you, you put a glamorous person in a world of no other human being, you, you believe that person will still be glamorous, in which case no, no um, uh, feedback mechanism is needed. But when I think about, I don't, I don't obviously understand it, um, understand it. When I think about a glamorous person, uh, I feel like that person is glamorous, true glamour I'm talking about, because there is some interaction. Well, it can certainly, I mean, it's certainly expressed in interaction. I would say that. Yes. Um, but assuming that, you, you see, I mean, I think a person, a, a human being, can't develop any any interior properties without some interaction with others. And, yeah. but I do think that a, a glamorous person who finds himself or th themselves um, outside of a social context, um, certainly their glamour doesn't disappear because it has to do with the, mm. their, the whole take on the world that they have. And their, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, as Danto puts it, you know, what they're, um, you know, the fragment of this other world. Um, yeah. So that's, um, you know, there, there's a, so I think that also, if you think about it as, something that a person doesn't manufacture. That's the other thing. It's not manufactured. Right. So, right. Um, I would say, you know, why couldn't the person in the absence of, I mean, certainly true, I mean, with false glamour, um, you know, there has to be a whole social context for that to arise. <clears throat> right. Excuse me. But I would say that uh, to express a self, you can you can live in a world in which you suddenly find yourself the only human being, the only person, and um, you can still you live in that world. It has to do with the way one lives in that world. Yeah, the challenge would be since we haven't observed a glamorous person in an empty world. It's a bit like asking when a, when a tree falls in the, in the woods, uh, if there's nobody around, <laughs> right. does it make a sound? Right. Um, yeah. We don't know <laughs> if a glamorous person in a, in a world of nobody else remains glamorous. It, it's, it's an assumption, right? Well, it partly follows, I, I think it follows in part from the way I'm defining it because it has to do yeah. with how that person inhabits this world of no one else. <laughs> so, yeah. d does that make sense? Or, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah. I mean you're, you're defining it as such. Uh, and so by definition, that has to be the case. It's an innate property. Uh, it, it doesn't, that property does not require any feedback mechanism, and hence that property will will be there regardless of context, regardless of environment. Um, but but it, it, for, it follows from definition, right? Well, yeah, in, in that part, is, um, yeah. but also from, I, I suppose, um, our observations, I mean, to me, of the human scene, and uh because it's it is a real phenomenon i think you know that this yeah. coercion that some uh persons have and you know it puzzled me I mean, what what creates it where does it come from you know and so yeah i, I hate to devalue it carol but one could 
one could envision a situation that there is a whole magnetic chemical process <laughs> since you're using the term coercion um that you know some sort of chemical magnetic process the person is utilizing hmm. so it's more like the witch right <laughs> is that which is you know where where the word comes from in a, in a sense i mean part one of the roots of it but it um so so you're seeing it more as is uh is a kind of magic, a, a kind of spell that. Uh, it's a, yeah, I mean, it's a, wouldn't that, yeah, wouldn't, does it feel like a spell to you, glamour? Mm, well, I don't know. I think that <clears throat> uh, it might bewitch somebody, but I don't think. I don't think that it's a conscious effort to be witch, the way false glamour is. And some people, by the way, pull that off yeah, very yeah. well, the false glamour. Yeah, it doesn't have to be conscious, um, but it could still be a spell sort of thing, right? Uh, it is inherent, it is innate, uh, it doesn't require any effort by the individual but it is, it is a process that surrounds that in individual. Um, could think yes, about well, it that I think way. Actually, that, that's that's intriguing. Um, so that even though it's not consciously cultivated, but that makes yeah. it, I think, um, still an internal, internal to the self, unique to to a self to. Uh, a person's psychic um, it's part of a person's psychic economy I suppose um, to, to do yeah. that um, but right. uh, yeah so but that would still not it, it wouldn't be inconsistent with with my idea of it as an imaginative operation or an operation of the imagination mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but I do think, yeah, I do yeah. think you're right that it, we can't ignore the effect, uh, the third person effect, but I don't think the third person effect is what creates it. Because right. that, right. see, if we think about, say, a color, like think about the color, you know, a, a, a color like um, Robin's egg blue, okay, <laughs> this light, bright blue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that there's certain physical properties of the surface when it interacts in certain, you know, conditions of light, then we have that experience of the color. But I think that what's different from, you know, say, um, uh, uh, an object or say a, um, a wall that's, that's blue and the person, because that does require a perceiver to see the blueness of it. Um, but yeah. I think that what's different with glamour or with an aesthetic property of a person is that it really lies in the subjectivity of it. And then these properties might have effects on others. And the, that's, that may be something, that may be something more predictable, but it doesn't mean that the person himself or herself is consciously trying to project that, as would be the case with right. false glamour. And because uh, that person may go into seclusion and still have the same property. So right. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely see that. So, um, uh, the the I think that your questions, I I don't think I have a straight answer to them. Um, I, I thought I came down to no, but I'm going back now. <laughs> Carol, that, <laughs> uh, because I think you know uh, there, there was this test. Um, 
that you know uh, to identify a machine that behaves like a human uh, you know to, to you can devise a set of tests and you can say it's a machine or a human uh, similarly i think a machine could devise a set of tests for a human and identify if that human is glamorous or not i think ultimately well it'd be interesting to know what um, it would be i mean i um perhaps you could yeah articulate that far better than I could. Um, <laughs> what would count as uh, a test for that? Um, and I guess that's, yeah, yeah. that would be more of an empirical question. And the philosophical question right. is w whether it makes sense, even conceptually, to think of that as something that can be tested scientifically. Um, because not everything about a human being can be. Um, we are, I, I think, uh, there's always something that eludes the physical, um, that escapes it. <laughs> yeah, I'm clearly biased about this. I'm less and less enamored by humans. Um, I don't see anything really special about them. Uh, and so I think it is sort of a transition period. We had humans <laughs> running around. No, but your, your thoughts here are, are, are really, um, really asking the question, you know, in some sense, I can reframe your question as more fundamentally. Is there anything, anything special about humans more broadly? Well, yeah, I would say, you know, I mean, I think there yeah. is, um, which, uh, and that's because, I mean, you may not agree with this, but I think a human, unlike a, something that's an alien intelligence or artificial intelligence, um, I think that a human has consciousness. I think that yeah. each human being has a uniqueness that can't be reproduced, some more interesting than others, uh, and that the uniqueness comes from their, their subjectivity, their subjective psychic structure and way of looking at the world. Yeah. And it's hard to imagine something non-human uh, having having consciousness in the way that we do. Something that isn't biologically generated. I, although I, I don't know. I mean, I, I had I did have a debate with a with a scientist about this once because he was talking about how there was some group of researchers who were trying to reproduce a brain um, that would be like a human brain and would mm. have consciousness. And it just seemed to me so bizarre given what, you know, what consciousness is, whatever it is. <laughs> and, um, yeah. you know, the fact that we do have these first person experiences um, what is that, you know, and there are things that we can take in. I mean, machines, aren't they highly dependent upon <laughs> human programming and so forth? Um, um, not necessarily, you know, um, we, we already create machines that are able to learn mm -hmm. by themselves. And so, so, so the fundamental issue there is, there is, um, things can be learned just like humans do uh, from data, right? And, and machines can do that as well. Um, now, the, the question about consciousness, we are in some sense, we are handicapped, we are suffering from human-centric um, views, right? We we think our brain is, you know, very complex. Uh, we have consciousness. Um, many people believe only humans have consciousness. 
I completely disagree with that. We can see animals oh, very I easily agree having that consciousness. Too. I agree with you. definitely. Definitely. And so if you agree with that, then Carol, you can you can bring that the complexity of the animal that is housing consciousness less and less. You can go down that mm -hmm. animal spectrum. And unless you believe at some point consciousness stops and it will be an arbitrary, you know, sort of a stoppage point, right? So, so I go from, you know, complex uh, biological systems to less complex, less complex and so on. And if, if we believe I'm seeing consciousness in those systems, you know, yeah, at some point you'll get a very simple system like mm -hmm. a zebrafish, for example. And you find consciousness there too. There's only 100,000 neurons and uh, many of the decisions are made by a few thousand neurons. We already have many orders of magnitude higher complexity in machines. And so if zebrafish, for example, has consciousness, then we are definitely very close to uh, machines having consciousness yeah. as well. Can a machine, though, I mean, see, I think it's, there's a kind of, um, well, I don't know, again, I'm, I'm not an expert here, but we'd have to change our whole theory of emotion um, if we were to say that machines yeah. could have the kind of complex consciousness and um, just uh, experience of the world. I mean, it almost sounds uh, counter, well, it seems to me counterintuitive, but um, so that, you know, we, we might see them performing intellectual tasks and calculations and so forth, but uh, isn't there some kind of residue that uh, in the human experience that the machine can't have? Or <clears throat> if, if you can reduce experience to data then we will get to a point that we can feed that data to a machine. Uh, and so, you know, people talk about, I think, uh, I don't know the movie Her that you mentioned. Um, you know, people talk about you can download your brain mm -hmm. uh, where all the data reside. So if you download it and re-upload it, you can, you know, basically upload your personality to, to a machine, for instance. Well, yeah, I guess that, but that hasn't been done. Um, no, no, you're nowhere yeah, close so, to that. You <laughs> see, I, I don't know. I mean, it, uh, a machine is obviously not a biological entity. Um, and I don't know even what it means to talk about a machine having emotions or would a machine have an unconscious, for example, or a subconscious uh, would a machine have traits and dispositions? Would it have individuality, you know, the kind of singularity that we see on the human scene? Not to say that humans are, as you say, so spectacular or that there's anything special about them. Okay, I'll leave that aside. Um, but, uh, you know, we certainly see a wide range of of intelligence and emotional sensitivity and et cetera in human beings. But, um, you know, there's a certain complexity there um, in which we have this inseparability. Um, and you, you may be familiar, say, with um, Thomas Damasio's um, book, Descartes' Error. I don't know. Um, Oh, I'm not. Well, he, yeah. he tries to show that, uh, and, and I'm really, this has just came to my mind and it's based on my memory, but that, you know, we can't separate yeah. cogn cognition from our affective at selves. So that, you know, brain, um, Descartes separates the, the intellect from the rest of the person, at which actually he inherits from Plato and then. Uh, certain um, Christian philosophers. Um, but 
you know, so that if the intellect is going to be the, the focus, which is what I'm, I think, well, which I, I may be wrong, but I, I, I understand you as saying that, um, that, I mean, according to him, the intellectual work that we do, our intellectual lives are inseparable from our affective lives. Mm. And, which, and yeah, that, uh, so it's hard to imagine for me, the machine having a personality and having that, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, the, the issue we always run into is that um, we we have very strong human centric views, right? So that that sort of prevents us from thinking this way. Um, it, it, we are nowhere close to any of these, but there is no technical reason why we can replicate a human being in the future. Uh, it won't be, n not even in the next 100 years, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to pin down the time, but at some, there's no technical reason one cannot replicate a human being with all the personality, all the data, because everything is fundamentally driven by data. That's the that's assumption there. But your, um, your characteristic, a glamour, makes that problem much more complicated. Um, intellectual capabilities, emotions, um, personality, all of that is really replicatable. But it seems to me that glamour is going to be much more, it's an order of magnitude higher uh, concept, primarily because it is, as you say, it's really difficult to define true glamour, <laughs> right? Uh, we know it exists, but we don't really have a very clear definition for it. So there, there might be a set of characteristics that human has. I don't know what they are. Glamour is certainly one of them that cannot be very highly defined. And that might be the last set of characteristics that, um, that may <laughs> let the human live among. They give us our humanness. Um, or our, yes, our, our distinctiveness <laughs> it may save us. Yes. Um, I also wonder if, you know, not just emotions, but, and this is something that I, I think we discussed brief, very briefly, um, is whether um, a machine could have aesthetic appreciation. You know, it can, maybe it can create yeah. art, but but can it appreciate art? And that's something um, perhaps you would have something to say about. <laughs> but Yeah, I think um, this is where, you know, uh, I think about this, Carol, that in this way. So a machine, um, machine will have average characteristics. It will have a bias toward, mm -hmm. toward the average. So in a world of machines, we will, we will see machines doing similar things. Um, they, they will have a bias toward average. So when you say, will it be able to appreciate things? It, it will be able to appreciate if it is average. I'm just making this up. Um, if you have things on the edges, on both sides of the distribution of uncertainty, it will likely fail because um, it, it just, it, it seems like a waste of time from the machine's perspective. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. So, you know, a piece of art, there is nothing comparable to it. It is all the way to the right extreme in terms of, you know, some utility for humans the machine might consider that to be reasonably useful. <laughs> I think a lot of people do too, <laughs> um, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and I do think that's unfortunate. But so the machine would not appreciate it because the machine 
um, in a sense, has been programmed to value utility and and uh, time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and a machine could not appreciate nature. See, I don't even know what it means to predicate appreciation of a machine, and, and <laughs> I, I look to you to explain that to me. So. It might, I mean, it might also be that, again, we are, we are coming up with these terms um, because we have a human-centric architecture, right? So we, we have these terms as if uh, nobody else other than humans would understand them, but it might be figments of our own imagination. So um, what do we mean by appreciation is could be reduced to, you know, set of emotions. Emotions can be reduced to a set of neurons firing, and there are a set of conditions under which those neurons fire. So you can, you can reduce that to some physical process you know, the, the, the term appreciation. Now, humans won't like that because humans would say, well, you know, appreciation is a very complex thing. You can't really reduce it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it, I've thought about that a lot and uh, studied this whole problem. I, I think that, um, you know, of course, in my training as a philosopher and then later, um, no, I mean, I think that certain aspects of consciousness are irreducible. Um, that there's always some kind, some kind of residue that is left out. <laughs> um, and I think that that's... Uh, so, so really, to say that a machine could appreciate... Um, something aesthetically. I mean, I think animals can have appreciation of, you know, I've seen... You know, sure, absolutely. M yes, music. music um, uh, they can appreciate, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I studied music for many years, and I had a dog who, who would always sit with me when I practiced, come right in. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I could always get her to, um, to come over, you know, no matter what, if uh, I, I were, if I were practicing. So, but also I think they appreciate it just, actually what Schopenhauer said that I, I think is spot on is that he said um, that it, the dogs appreciate the present moment. He praised them for their ability that he thought human beings didn't have. I mean, mm. today I guess we'd call it mindfulness in the current <laughs> part. That's right. <laughs> But he he, he, oh. he said that dogs had uh, had this ability to to just live in the present moment and appreciate it, and uh, to some extent that's true. Although I also think that they're rather they can be future looking. <laughs> you know, they uh, they want yeah. things that they don't have, you know, and so forth. Um, uh, so so that would be. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, I think I don't, yeah, I, I just don't know what it would mean. So you have to assume then that all human uh, processes of, that we call consciousness can be reduced to a set of data. And yeah. once you do that, it's, um, it, it's no problem. It's a hop, skip, and a jump for the, <laughs> for the machine to have, uh, these experiences too and and i guess that then the fundamental question is can this all be reduced to data and yes i think that my my analysis of glamour <laughs> rests on the presumption that you can't <laughs> right right that is the that is the fundamental question can everything be reduced to data um, and related question is, is there anything really special about the human system? Um, I, it's very difficult to prove. Um, uh, so we, we don't have an answer to the first question, can everything be reduced to data? Uh, the trends are, things are being reduced to data. So how far can we go uh, is an open question. 
um, is is there, uh, you know, the, the second part of it is, um, is there, you know, something special about about the human system, um, such as consciousness, that is not really driven by data, that is sort of external to the system, and so we don't actually see it, uh, and hence we will never be able to see it. Um, and again, the jury's out on that as well. Um, but the, the trends are in the direction of the human being reduced, Carol, unfortunately. So, so you, you have to you have to uh, you have to defend glamour as as a uniquely human property. This might be the only thing we may have well, to defend I, mm, okay. in hundred years. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> maybe so. I mean, but I I do think though that it's hard to imagine how you reduce imagination to a set of data. I mean, when it's so, <laughs> it, it seems to escape rule governed behavior. Does that make sense? <laughs> I, mean, do you, do you see, yeah. I mean, does my question make sense to you? I'm just asking. Uh, it, the question makes sense. I'm obviously very highly biased and unbiased about this. Uh, I'll always go back and say, um, the, the, these uh, ideas that we have, imagination, imagination could be thought of, you know, sort of experimentation. Um, it, it could be thought of random, you know, random noise um, introduced into a thought process. So I always go, I always land in a spot. I'm not saying this is right. I always land on a spot that says, yeah, anything is ultimately reduced to data. In which case, um, in which case, it, you know, hmm. you can make a machine do it. <laughs> well, maybe glamour will be the <laughs> counterexample. <laughs> <laughs> glamour will be the counterexample. Well, so when know. is the book coming I, I mean, out? Probably next year because um, I'm still, you know, tidying up the manuscript. But um, I'll alert yeah. you to it, <laughs> certainly. Ex excellent. Yeah, this has been uh, this has been great, oh, Carol. Been Thanks so much for spending time with and, me. And actually, I mean, I've, I've I've learned a tremendous amount in thinking through this with me. You've you've asked me some very difficult questions, <laughs> and uh, so I I appreciate that. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.